Blessed Sunday, brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ. God is good. His love endures forever. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Shall we all stand? Scripture declares, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people, both now and forevermore. Let us declare the presence and authority of God in this place and in our lives. Let us pray together. Lord God Almighty, our Father in heaven, we exalt your name in the highest. We bow in reverent awe of you, for you are above all. Yet we draw close to you, for you are most gracious, full of compassion and abounding in love and mercy towards us, your children. Thank you for your gift of eternal salvation life in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit living in us, helping us in our lives for you. Thank you for carrying us through another week, providing our needs, directing our steps, healing our sicknesses, protecting us from evil, 
giving us opportunities for sharing the gospel and blessing us to be a blessing to others. Holy God, forgive us our sins for not loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, for not loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Please listen to our confessions and have mercy on us. Together, loving God, in faith and with deep gratitude, receive your forgiveness and cleansing from sin, and ask that you help us live according to the leading of your Holy Spirit. As we worship you, we pray that the light of your truth transform our hearts and minds to conform more and more to the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose precious name we pray. Amen.
Please stand. Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 to 17, and chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Let us read responsibly. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth, who went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will seek God. May God bless us in the reading and with the understanding of this message for us. Today is the second Sunday in Lent, a season to focus on the life and sacrifice of our Lord for the salvation of the world and in our daily devotions. Let this be our reflection. Last Sunday we meditated on Jesus' 40-day fasting and prayer in the wilderness before he started his public ministry and the lessons we can learn from there. Now and for the next Sundays leading up to his glorious resurrection, we shall reflect on what he taught, what he did, and how God worked out his salvation plan in Jesus Christ. After Jesus' victorious struggle against the devil in the wilderness, Matthew tells us that Jesus began to preach. Matthew, also called Levi, was a tax collector, one of the twelve disciples of Jesus. So this is a very important uh, bit of information for us to be assured that the writings of Matthew were drawn out of his uh, close association and discipleship with Jesus Christ. And uh, Matthew summarizes the overarching message of Jesus preaching from start to finish in these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The same was the message of John the Baptist as he preached in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This only goes to show that as the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who was anointed to prepare the way for the Lord, John had brought the same message for the people, the same message as what Jesus declared as the uh, very introductory statement of his preaching ministry. John said he was a nobody compared to the coming Messiah, whose sandals he was not worthy to carry. Nevertheless, 
They both had one common message, and that is to call sinners to repentance and to announce the good news of the coming of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God mean the same thing. They are actually interchangeable with the former, the kingdom of heaven, focusing more on the kingdom rule, whereas the latter or the kingdom of God all is focused more on the kingdom ruler, thus the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. In both cases, it refers to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the order of life, where God is recognized and obeyed as the supreme ruler of his people. The kingdom of heaven is also understood to be a spiritual kingdom where Jesus Christ is Lord, as we Christians profess and attest to. We know that uh, that is true. After the Holy Spirit was poured out um, abundantly during Pentecost and continuing at the present time as Jesus has promised, that is the spiritual kingdom. And it also refers to a physical kingdom. A, maybe we could call it a political kingdom where Christ will be present in the world to rule perfectly. This is actually the understanding of the Jews. This was their expectation of their Messiah in his first coming. While we Christians believe that that actual kingdom rule is not yet, but that it is coming and will be when the second coming of Christ is here. Now speaking of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for spiritual, spiritual revival in our time, you might have heard or read the news last month about students at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky, who began to hold spontaneous and continuous worship at their campus after a scheduled chapel service had ended. Now it is called the Asbury Awakening or the Asbury Revival, which eventually saw thousands of students and even non-students and people from around the world uh, causing a revival leading to similar gatherings at other schools and churches in the United States up to this time. Well, one university official commented that the gatherings were orderly, they were worshipful, and very inspiring. And this bids well for us in our time, especially when we generally think that the American society, especially among the youth, has already gone to a state of uh, uh, non-religiosity or where many uh, tend to move from other religions to the atheistic way of life. Well, there is something happening right now, starting with the campuses, the universities in some states, and it is gaining much fire. But regardless of the time or, or place, Jesus' message then and now to all is this, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The greatest news of all time and for all people is that forgiveness of sins for eternal salvation is within reach. It is not far away. Nobody has to go up to heaven in order to, to reach it, nor go down to the very depths to dive into that secret. No, it is available to all who would repent and come to the Lord, come to the Savior. Repentance entails confession or the admission of sins before God, and then contrition or sincere sorrow. That means being sorry for the sins 
And then conversion, meaning changing one's perspective about life and leaving sin and coming to God to submit to His will and ways. And then finally, of course, and this is the point at which most of us should be right now, and that is commitment, continuing in faith. Now, every person needs to repent in order to be saved. Even after we have been reborn of the Holy Spirit through faith, we Christians, as God's yet work in progress, need to humbly repent of our sins. And that is why part of our liturgy in worship is the prayer of confession and repentance. As 1 John 1 9 says, every sin is to be humbly confessed and repented of. That is part of our reverence, our way of life, the reverent way of life before a perfectly holy God. 1 John 1 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now Matthew informs us that it was after John the Baptist had been in prison that Jesus relocated from his hometown of Nazareth to Capernaum in Galilee to begin his public ministry. Before this, yes, he did go to the people, he, uh, he taught, but that was mostly one-on-one, -on -one, very quietly at first. But at this point, we see Jesus coming out. It was his time to go public. It is in the later chapter, though, where Matthew explains the reason for John the Baptist's imprisonment, and that is because he was unjustly uh, imprisoned upon the prodding of King Herod's new wife, Herodias, who wanted to stop John from condemning her unlawful marriage to King Herod. She was actually married to Philip, the brother of King Herod. And uh, she was not just satisfied with simply imprisonment, but later on, she had the opportunity to ask for the head of John the Baptist. She asked that he be beheaded and his head be served to her in a platter. This reminds us of one of the Beatitudes that Jesus later taught, saying, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. John the Baptist was one of those persecuted prophets of righteousness in the New Testament. We know of a number of others who suffered persecution in the Old Testament. Without true repentance, there is no genuine salvation. Receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as Lord and Savior does not merely mean a profession that is out of an emotion of the moment or a half-hearted, impulsive statement. No, there must be a a condition, there must be that conviction of repentance, an acknowledgement of how sinful one is before the Lord. Without true repentance, there is no cleansing of sin. Without cleansing from sin, darkness of spirit will cover the unbeliever. The darkness of guilt will hover over the unrepentant believer who allows himself to stray away from the Father's hand. 
Jesus preached in Capernaum, which is located in the area bounded by Zebulun and Naphtali in Galilee of the Gentiles. The prophet Isaiah had prophesied this, and that is why Matthew pointed this out in his narration of the events in Matthew chapter 4. The prophet Isaiah said that the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And Matthew takes this prophecy to point to the light of Christ. His salvation, his words as the light rising and shining forth, enlightening, bearing witness, and increasing people in the knowledge of the truth about the kingdom of heaven and the way to it and the way to stay within that kingdom. Now John the Baptist preached repentance of sins, but the greater one whom he said he was ushering in was the great light of salvation. He was the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. At that time, John had gathered a great number of followers. But when Jesus began his public ministry, John said, he, referring to Jesus, must increase, I must decrease. John's purpose in the world was to exalt Christ and not himself. How symbolic then is God's timing of the events as we as it unravels before us, that after John's death, as we are told by Matthew, Jesus should begin his public ministry. The forerunner, John, had accomplished his mission, his life mission. He had ushered and exalted the Lamb of God, pointed to him, and now it was Jesus' turn to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So what might that kingdom be like? For sure it was a kingdom that the Jews aspired for. They were looking forward to a kingdom of righteousness. Well, Jesus began simply by enumerating how the converted people of God should view life, particularly the blessed life of salvation. What was it going to be like? We read his teachings in chapter 5, part of which is referred to as the Beatitudes, or the state of being blessed. We just read a big portion of it, not all of it, it is the Beatitudes, the state of being blessed. It is a present state of the blessedness of being a Christian. Not something that is yet to come. It is something that is realized simply because we are in the Lord. Although we know that whatever blessing we have or enjoy here is multiplied in infinite measure in the eternal life to come. The blessings that we enjoy are but a poor shadow. It is but a, um, a shadow of the greater things, the reality that is yet to come. Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes, how blessed you are, Christian. And this is how you should see yourself. This reign of the kingdom of heaven is already here, it is near you at my coming in your life. So let's go through some of those uh, characteristics, some very concrete examples and description of what it means to live the Christian life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed indeed is the man who has realized his own utter poverty, his helplessness, 
and who has put his whole trust in God. Aren't we like that? He is unburdened from his worldly cares and fear of the uncertainties of, of fear of the uncertainties of life because he has put his whole trust in God come what may. The world does not honor the helpless, the seeming helpless, and even those who admit to their need of a supreme being. Rather, it looks up to the self-sufficient, the self-made, the powerful. But Jesus says, repent, change your view about such things. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Oh, the blessedness of the man whose heart is crushed for the world's suffering and for his own sin. For out of this sorrow, he will find the comfort and joy of the Lord. Nowadays, there is so much that crushes our hearts. The Christian who takes the world's suffering to prayer, takes all of these to God in prayer, will be comforted by God's sovereignty and control despite the troubles of the world. That is why we can still come and worship and rejoice and sing. Not because we are oblivious or insensitive, to the troubles of the world, but because God comforts us and tells us that He continues to sit, to sit on the throne of heaven. He is in control. The man who experiences the sorrow of sickness, of financial need, of a great lack of knowledge and wisdom, will experience the joy of how God provides miraculously and through these all is able to carry about life with the help of others. And so this man will come out a more grateful person. And so we say, Lord, thank you for how you have provided for me in my time of need. In my time of ignorance, in my time of fear, people came to my rescue. Lord, out of nowhere, you provided a person to guide me, to help me, to instruct me, to inspire me. The man who realizes the ugliness of sin and its consequences also will learn about the sorrow that engulfs one and will be even more grateful that God in his mercy has saved him and spared him or her from condemnation. Indeed, how blessed the man whose eyes are open to God's goodness in the midst of suffering so that in the end he will be truly comforted. There is a God of comfort in the midst of all these burdens. People yearn for a life of comfort, of ease, freedom from pain or care in this world. That is the idea of what it means to be successful, what it means to be able to overcome anything and everything. But Jesus says, repent, change your mind, learn how to feel sorrow for your sin, Learn how to feel misery for the misery of others, then you will experience the deeper blessings of God. And then Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness, humility, perhaps, is a proper synonym 
Blessed is the man who has the humility to know that there is a lot he does not know. That he has a portion of weaknesses as do others and who realizes his own need for God and for others. This is the man who is teachable and so then he will be open to the truth and the knowledge of God and for that he will inherit the treasures of wisdom that can only come from God. How happy indeed is that man who does not have to live a double life of pretense and hypocrisy. Who is content with the gifts that God has given him and positively develops what he has for God's glory and not to impress others, but more to serve. The world looks down upon meekness. Uh, it, is, it is sometimes equated with spinelessness and uh, weakness, something to be shameful about, something that shows a spirit of defeat. But Jesus says, repent, change your mind about how you view weakness, and you will reap the blessing of a confidence in God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who are so filled with an eagerness to just be in the presence of a holy God. For they will be filled. In our world today, the word or the term that seems to be politically correct is compromise and accommodation. Many people would settle for righteousness that is good enough, at least it is not as bad. Because as they say, anyway partial good is better than no good at all. But Jesus says the Christian is blessed because God's holiness elevates his standard of righteousness to that of God's. That is a standard it cannot be attained in a person's lifetime. It is a standard. It is what we look up to. And our righteousness, of course, is only declared by God through Jesus Christ whose blood has made us clean. Nevertheless, the man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness yearns to keep the straight path, not to compromise, to obey God for righteousness' sake. And yet, that man knows how to treat others with sympathy in their weaknesses, in their helplessness. He will not condone what is evil or good in God's sight, but will do whatever is necessary to put things aright, as long as it is within his capacity. Sometimes, when everything else has failed, the action stops and we go to the Lord in prayer, and we know, yes, God does answer prayer. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is part of what Jesus says is the spirit of the kingdom of heaven. It is true that those who are truly interested in understanding others, showing not only sympathy but also giving practical help, will themselves receive the sympathy of others in their time of need. This includes being able to forgive. The world will sometimes extract an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus says, repent. Change your mind about it. Allow yourself to give more than what you receive. 
to get hurt more than what you deserve. Finally, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Greek word here for pure means unmixed, unadulterated, unalloyed. That is why this beatitude is such a tall order. Blessed are the pure in heart. It could be translated as follows. Blessed is the man whose motives are always entirely pure, unmixed, unadulterated, for that man shall see God, shall be close to God, shall know God more. Very seldom are our motives pure. Very seldom are they selfless or without guile. There may be something good in them, but then sometimes we know it is mixed with something else. Right? Sometimes we want to be good to someone, not, not just for goodness sake or for us to be able to get their sympathy, but we, we are good to them because we, we want something in return. But as we draw closer to God in His Word and prayer, though our motives most of the time may be mixed, we will notice that the Holy Spirit puts up a red flag whenever there is an evil motive in what we are about to do. The most we can do at that point is to confess that sin. It is the Holy Spirit who teaches us to catch ourselves and let us ask God to take it away from our heart and mind. It is just as simple as that. God knows how sinful we are. He knows it, but that does not change His standard of holiness. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have barely scratched the surface of God's of Jesus' deep ocean of love and wisdom. How beautiful is this kingdom of heaven that he has spoken of and that we continue to study and try to be part of because we are in Christ. Indeed, there is much that needs to be changed in the way we think, feel, and conduct our lives. May this season of Lent bring us to our knees before God and convict us enough to begin to change our priorities so that we can spend our time with the Lord who is able to work out the blessedness in our lives that we so eagerly seek and He so willingly and generously gives. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, ruler of all, yet our Father in heaven, we know, O oh Lord, that right now you are looking into our hearts and minds. You know the thoughts that are racing. You know the motives of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that despite the uncleanness and impurities, you love us. You sympathize with us. And most of all, Lord, you have cleansed us and you continue to clean us because we are your children. Collectively, we are your bride, Lord Jesus. And you said that you are preparing us to be a bride without, without stain or wrinkle or blemish. By your power, by the power of your love, 
and justice. Lord, how beautiful it is indeed to know that your promises are true. Thank you for describing to us the joy, the blessedness of really submitting to the kingdom of heaven to which you have made us belong because of Jesus Christ. Salamat Panginoon na kami ay naroon sa kaharian na yun. Maaring hindi man namin yan lubos na naiintindihan. Hindi namin isinasapamuhay dahil sa kakulangan ng aming kaalaman. Dahil sa kabalututan ng aming mga isipan. Salamat Panginoon na tinutubig mo kami. Dearest Lord, we, we indeed pray that by your Holy Spirit, we will be able to enter more and more into the joy of the kingdom. The kingdom that is now in our hearts and living among us, brothers and sisters in Christ, and the larger body of Christ, the one body of Christ. Father, forgive us for the many times that we have not lived according to our identity. We have not lived according to the privilege of that blessedness. We submit our minds and hearts to you, O God, right now, even as our eyes are closed, our hearts are bowed before you. Thank you, Lord, that even just in our meditation and prayer, something is happening with our spirits. Something is happening in our very persons, in the deepest parts of our hearts. We pray, O oh God, that this, is an, this season of Lent will truly be a transforming time for each and every one of us. Not only as individuals, but as a family, and most especially as a church. As we realize that this is the season also when we actually are celebrating our anniversary as a church year after year. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that in the excitement and mirth, the joy of celebrating the many years of faithfulness, your faithfulness to us, we should never be, we should never forget that first of all, O oh God, we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and that we need you moment by moment from the beginning of our rebirth up to the very end when we shall see you face to face. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have showered upon us. Thank you, Lord. Make us a grateful people make us a compassionate family of believers make us lord more and more truly your followers lord jesus in every sense of that word of discipleship lord we uh, just want to declare right now that we entrust you O oh lord with our lives we lift up to you everything that is abundant right now, be it in health, in material resources, abundance in friends and loved ones, abundance, O oh God, of fruitfulness in our ministry, abundance in the successes of our respective work or study. We also want to lift up to you, Lord, our lack, our needs, the weaknesses of body, the lack of wisdom, Lord, we also lift up to you, O oh God, the lack in terms of material things, the finances, Lord, to be able to pay all our obligations to support our family. Father, we ask you to supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. Father, we also know that you expect us to be good stewards of each and every talent of time, talent and time and treasure. Help us, O oh Lord, 
Manage them wisely for the glory of your name. Lord, we pray for um, our church, especially as we look forward to the celebration of our 90th year. Help us, Father, to continue strong, especially, Lord, in our mission as a church to be disciples and to make disciples of all nations. We pray, O oh God, that you will help us celebrate this, especially on Anniversary Sunday, in a way that will really bless your heart and will be a testimony of your wonderful work here at Cosmopolitan Church as a body and in our individual lives as Christians and as a Christian family. Lord, give us the joy of uh, service in the midst of all the stresses, in the midst of all the responsibilities. Father, we pray that we will continue to serve with joy and love and generosity. Look with favor also, Lord, upon those who are leading and helping make this come to pass. We remember our church planting areas in Bacoor, Little Chardino, San Andres, Santa Mesa, San Pedro, and Pasay, and in Leyte. Oh Lord God, we praise you and thank you for entrusting these brothers and sisters in Christ to us. Thank you, Lord, for their growth. Thank you, Lord, for how you have saved them and also how you are increasing their fruits all through these years. Lord, we ask that there be a revival, a spiritual revival, however that may take whatever form it may be in our lives, we know it is your Holy Spirit who will work this out. We pray, Lord, for the revival that is now happening in the United States. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be powerful among those, especially the young people, the students. Lord, we know that you are so good and that your Holy Spirit will direct and uh, correct your people who are truly repentant and bowed and submitted before you. Thank you, Lord. May that turn the tide, especially the tide that is taking um, the young people away from you. Thank you, Lord, that indeed your, your word is true. Greater is he who is in us, the Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. Father, we lift up to you the Philippines, the nation that we love. We pray, O oh God, that you will continue to just be strong in the uh, efforts, especially of Christians in government and in the private sector, to serve you, to serve you well, our nation, our people. O oh Lord God, we know that you will never let the enemy your enemies win over you. You are a great God. Help us, Lord, to be brave and courageous as we stand by you. And for the many men and women who are working to bring the gospel far and wide, to bring the good news of salvation, that the kingdom of heaven is near, has come. It is in Jesus Christ. Bless them, O oh God. Bless us also, Lord, with the opportunity to partner with more missions-minded organizations, even as we pray for our partners. Bless all their efforts, O oh God. May everything, O oh Lord, that we have um, planned for ourselves, for our families, for our church, be in accordance with your will. Align them, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us continue our worship with the giving of our offerings, knowing that God is the owner of everything, and we are the stewards of His resources. Let us give to God what belongs to Him generously and cheerfully.
Gracious Lord, we thank you for these blessings which you have given us to be used for your work through our church. Bless them and multiply them that they may accomplish your plans and purposes. To the praise and glory of your name. Amen. Let us prepare to participate in the Lord's Supper by singing our song of preparation together. Our Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. 
on the night that he was betrayed, while he was at supper with his disciples, he took the bread, he gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup again, he gave thanks, offered the cup to his disciples and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. It will be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of you and remember me. Let us pray. Sovereign God, anoint us with a deepening of insight of your great love for our, for our Lord, of your great love for us. Set apart these symbols of our present and eternal communion with you. Make us experience, O oh Lord, the joy of participating in this most sacred communion. In Jesus' name, Amen.
shall we all stand and let us thank the Lord as we close this communion together. Blessed Sunday, everyone. Good morning. What a beautiful day it is. It's the first Sunday of March, and we are all together worshiping the Lord. Praise God. Yes, you may go ahead and clap your hands. <laughs> this is the time to clap our hands. Thank you, Lord. Um, first of all, we welcome one another. Let us turn our... Um, to our neighbor, left and right, front and back, and uh, uh, just be thankful to the Lord that they are here. Thank you very much, choir. You are alive again. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, our liturgists and all our participants in today's worship. I would just like to acknowledge the presence of a former pastor, beloved pastor of our church, the church planting pastor of uh, our uh, outreach once in the gig and now a, a local independent church, a full established uh, local church, none other than our Pastor Mercy Mejia. Good morning, Pastor. Praise the Lord you are here. Praise God and we hope that we, you are well and good and fine and that you will visit us again. Okay, as you know, Pastor Mercy is the mother of our sister Suzette, you know, yung ating tent making, uh, tent maker, missionary. Thank you so much for being your mother here, Suzette. And uh, we would also like to welcome 
uh, relatives of the Barmiz family. I don't exactly know the relationship. Uh, if your mother-in-law, mother-in-law with your uh, with the brothers and the other the family of Mike, of course, no. <laughs> and and uh, let us begin with Nancy. Ayan, si Mrs. Nancy Bamuiz. Good morning, Mrs. Bamuiz. Uh, together with her are Irish and Julian Bamuiz, or Julian Bamuiz, all the way from Davao. Welcome, welcome, welcome all. I remember they visited us before when Mr. Bamuiz was still alive. You know? Okay, so welcome, Mrs. Bamuiz, and the rest of the family. God bless you. Okay, meron pa po ba tayong mga bisita that I have not, uh, I am not aware of? Okay. Alright, so for our announcements, Children's Sunday School today at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, this is online. So parents and children, don't forget that is at 3 o'clock via Zoom. And uh, to next Sunday, second Sunday, will be our face-to-face uh, children's worship at the Escada Hall at 9 o'clock in the morning. So as you know, we are already back to face-to-face -face uh, worship service for the children. So don't forget, children and parents and guardians. And uh, uh, we also have our regular prayer watch still at uh, 8 o'clock in the evening. Every Wednesday, that is via YouTube. And then followed by... What we have started this year is our Wednesday prayer meetings, but this time online. Okay, so also on Zoom. So after the watching prayer watch on YouTube, in YouTube, then please uh, get inside our Zoom meeting right after that, where we have our prayers being led by several groups of our church. So we hope to see you there. and Continue to pray together as a church, especially as we are looking forward to uh, very important uh, events in the life of our church, namely our anniversary as well as the coming Holy Week. Okay, so praise the Lord, 90 years, mga kapatid, excited tayo, 90 years, a milestone. On March 26th is our anniversary worship service at 10 o'clock in the morning here at GSP. So we hope that you will be there and that you will also be with us in our lunch fellowship after the service down there at the Escoda Hall. Okay, so um, we have lunch reservation. We have started at the foyer last Sunday and also through the Google form. And uh, we hope that you will be able to join us. Please do register because this will be a catered buffet lunch. So uh, without the meal ticket, you will not be given a seat. No? So dapat, dapat may meal ticket kayo. And in order to get the meal ticket, you have to register and pay. Okay? Very affordable. This is church subsidized. Okay, now for the parents who may have little children, who may not have the appetite of a buffet, this is a five-course buffet, so, or six, you may opt for our kiddie meal, which is Jollibee, di ba? Mas gusto ng mga bata yun. No? And uh, this is, of course, going to be a little bit lower in price, still subsidized by the church. So if you have not yet registered, please take time to register right there at the back of the, uh, the foyer or through the Google form which was given to some of you. If you want to uh, to register by Google and you did not yet get the link, please let us know, okay? Any of our church uh, staff or you can also let me know, that would be okay. So we, that is a joint worship service with all our church planting area. So we look forward to that. And uh, well, we have something new coming up in uh, uh, in April. This will be on April 29th, which is a Saturday. Okay, through our partnership with um, the Grace School of Theology, they have uh, uh, so kindly um, chosen us as one of the churches to host this or to to host this. Uh, Half day, shall we say, uh, lecture 
a study on the principles of biblical interpretation. So this will equip all of us to know how to read our Bible and interpret it in a way that is uh, sound. No? So you can do this uh, so that you will be able to enjoy more your Bible study at home or with your family. This will be on April 29 at 8 to 10.30 in the morning, hosted by us. This is open to everyone. Uh, members or non-members, this will now be posted in our Facebook page. And uh, the speaker is Pastor Willie Gaines. He is the Dean of Students at Grace School of Theology in Texas. And he is also pastoring a church in the United States. So this is, this is free. And so feel free to uh, join this April 29th, Saturday. Okay, pass the word around and uh, we hope to see all of you there. Okay. Thank you very much. Happy birthday to Eunice Elaine Galao. I saw her this morning. Eunice Elaine. Let's sing. Happy birthday to Our loving Father in heaven, we praise you, Lord. We thank you for Eunice Elaine. Thank you, Lord, for her life. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful plan that you have for her life. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of life, protection, favor that you have so far given her, Lord. And we praise you that she is part of our church, she is part of our family of believers. On her birthday, O oh God, our prayer is that she may grow even more uh, deeply in love with you, closer to you, and uh, that she will know more and more the wonderful plans you have for her, that she may be encouraged, empowered, O oh Lord, to serve you. Father, you also please provide for all her needs, grant the desires of her heart as she delights in you. Lord, protect her with your mighty hand and the armor of God. May she always wear it, O oh Lord, wear it so that she may be protected from the wiles of the evil one. Father, we pray that she will be a blessing not only to her family but also to others around her and to our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may say And goodbye, everyone. A blessed week ahead.